I am the doctor, this is my section. Earth is under my protection. Planet of birth is Gallifrey. I've got two hearts, your life is safe. Run into the master raw messy. Come on, Alonzo. Alonzo. I am a time lord. No, I'm not rich. Twelve bodies of men. Now it's time for a switch. Don't look like that. I'm in great health. You were expecting someone else. Regeneration. Oh, such fun. When I say run, run, run. What's up, my boy? Peace and sanity. Sorry, I must dash. Reverse the polarity. Sometimes I'm north, but always a limey, wibbly, wobbly, timey, wimey. Jump in the TARDIS, go for a ride, it's bigger on the inside. Exploring all of time and space, oh what's that? Exterminate. Cyberman or Daleks maybe? Would you like a jelly baby? Time's ticking, we'd best go, a new adventure, Geronimo! I am fantastic, so are you, best come with me, I'm Doctor Who. Welcome to a brand new episode of D4WH. I am one of your hosts. Ever since I moved to Cardiff, the farting has stopped. I'm Adam O'Sullivan. <laughs> Joining me as always, if I move more than 10 feet away from her, I get zapped by 10,000 volts. It's Nakia Schutt. Hello. Welcome. You know, you said you wanted to try out these handcuffs. You oh, said look. you were up for a bit of experimenting and now... Here you are, whining about it on the podcast. I mean, you mentioned feet, and it sounds so much further, but it's actually only three metres. I didn't realise that. Even going to the bathroom, I get that. Yeah. (laughs) Unless she follows you in there. Yeah, and I won't go in with him, so, you know. No, I refuse. Put the camera down, Nikia. Yeah, he won't let me video him doing anything exciting. (laughs) Boring. Today, we are looking at an episode with the Sylvines, so we thought we wouldn't inflict that onto our guests. No farting jokes No fart. Well, yeah, plenty of farting jokes. We just won't inflict those on. I guess. Oh, okay. So it's just going to be the two of us and Beck Tech, so two and a half hosts is what I like to call it. Oh, you're half a host. Yeah, like two and a half men. (laughs) But a full-time technician. But actually good. (laughs) Yeah, two and a half women I like to call the show, and I'm the half a woman. Uh, We start as we always do with Doctor Who News. Nikki Wilson is a producer on Doctor Who, having produced the 2009 special The Waters of Mars, Mm. whilst producing the Sarah Jane Adventures at the same time. She left in 2011 to produce Casualty, returning to Doctor Who to produce episodes from Series 8 onwards. If you recall, we mentioned how after Doctor Who finished filming in Gloucester, she tweeted, Huge thanks to the people of Gloucester for being so patient with our filming Doctor Who in the last couple of days. You made us feel very welcome. On May 25th, we responded with a cheeky tweet, Any chance Doctor Who would ever come down to Australia to film? We're jealous that all the UK cities get all the fun. Mm. We never expected a response until June 26th. When Nikki responded, never say never. <gasps> so we basically have a link to the current series of Doctor Who. Oh, <laughs> yes. Right, we'll milk that for everything we can oh, get. Oh, yeah, fantastic. <laughs> uh, sorry, Nikki, please don't ever listen to this podcast. <laughs> Thankfully, we can't stalk you because we're overseas. It's, it's much, harder, much yeah, harder. It's much harder. We'll do our best. Google Earth is only so good at, yeah. at that sort of thing. <laughs> Unless we can catch it in front of her street <laughs> while the Google Earth maps were photos were being taken. All right, screwed. Doctor Who news that isn't related to us. Sean Pertwee is, of course, the son of John Pertwee. Mm. He is an actor much like his father, appearing most recently in Gotham as Bruce Wayne's butler, Alfred. Oh. In 2014 for Halloween, he dressed up as his late father's most famous role. Ooh. He's the spitting image. It's so good. Speaking to Dr. So he looks a lot like John? Yeah. yeah. Wow. You should see the picture. It's so good. Speaking to Doctor Who magazine for a special about the third Doctor, Pertwee mentions that he's been approached to be on the show, or as wow. he puts it, there were noises made about me being involved in some capacity, Ooh. which is sounds like someone trying to backtrack and be like, oh, yeah, I don't know what I can some say. Some capacity. Yeah. He goes on to say, I would very much like to do that as an ode to my father. Aww. He seems to think that because people would focus on his familial relationship to the show, the best kind of character would be an evil son or something weird. Ooh. Mm. Why can't he just come back and pretend to be his dad? There you go. I don't know. Maybe maybe you think that would be too weird. Well, somebody else has played the first Doctor. Why not? Yeah. He looks like him. All, all they need is to, for them to ask. Yeah. That would be cool to try and do a, a story with the third Doctor. He couldn't hold up to the the fourth Doctor, I'm afraid. He kind of slipped into the the abyss, but I did like, enjoy it while I was watching it. That would be good. Yeah, it would be good to I see him like on the show. I would like to see that. Did yeah. Tom Baker have any sons? Any of them look like him? I don't know. He had kids before he became an actor. I don't know if he had any other. No, than neither do I. I haven't, I haven't been stalky enough. Yeah, probably should be more stalky. So today we're going to review Boomtown. Ooh. Mm. Season 1, Episode 11, written by Russell T. Davies, directed by Joe Ahern, 
and originally broadcast on the BBC on Saturday, June the 4th, 2005. So I'll give you a synopsis before we get into it. Sure. Dr. Rose and Captain Jack are in Cardiff, powering up the TARDIS from the rift under the city. Mickey joins them, but he's not the only familiar face they see. Blonde fell foch passima de slabine. <laughs> Margaret, Margaret Blaine, is mayor of Cardiff and planning and planning an unstable nuclear plant to power her escape at the risk of the destruction of Earth. The Doctor takes her custody, but the lonely Savine will match wits against the Doctor to try and save her own life. Ooh, dun, 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 dun. Dun. Ah, the good old Slavine, what, hey? What memories did you have of this before you started watching it? So I hadn't, this was the first time I'd seen this episode. Ah, okay. I had actually didn't, so obviously when I when I first started watching Doctor Who, it was the season one, mm. and there was a few episodes where I either didn't sit down to watch them all, all the way through, or like... Like missed them completely and then just kind of picked up the gist later on. Oh, and he calls and this himself is, a Hoovian. Hey, I've gone back into watch it for these, but, you know, I <laughs> I didn't like the bits of the Slovene that I'd seen yeah. in that, those episodes, so I wasn't enthused about this episode. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I kind of get what's going on, blah, yeah. blah, blah. Slovene farting, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah. What was your rem- memories of this episode? I didn't have strong memories of liking or disliking it, just sort of remember the bit with the TARDIS looking in the eye of the t- into the heart yeah. of the TARDIS. Well, that's, that's all you really need to that know. That was all I, re- I really remembered. So it was interesting to sit down and watch it again um, from a different point of view. So we're talking about the Slovene from Raxico character. Raxacalico Phallopatorius. Raxacalico Phallopatorius. Hey, friggin' Rose is like that in this episode. Yeah. Raxacalico Phallopatorius. She's trying. I did it. I <laughs> did it, guys. I did it. <laughs> Woo, yay. First thing is, does this feel like a filler episode? I think it was to save the budget episode. Online you'll find two explanations for this episode. One, save the budget for the finale. Or mm. two, it's a filler episode that was put in to fill for an episode that was supposed to be part of the series mm. but couldn't be part of the series because the writer was busy with other stuff. Oh, okay. What was the series? What was the one it was supposed to be? Paul Abbott was originally approached about writing the episode that Boomtown replaces. Paul is best known for creating the TV series Touching Evil, Clocking Off and Shameless. He had oh, no to, shameless. Yes. He had to pull out of writing for Doctor Who due to other commitments. But there was also reports that Russell T. Davies wanted to change parts of the script. The scrapped episode was called The Void and was set in Pompeii, AD 79, just before the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Oh. Which is why Captain Jack talks about Volcano Day in the previous episode. Oh. Yeah. That makes sense. The Void would have also had the revelation that the Doctor had been manipulating Rose's entire life <gasps> to try and make her the perfect companion. Oh, my God, that's creepy. Yeah, which would have made the, the revelation that they, she falls in love with him very creepy. Yeah, very grooming, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so... Oh. Um, it would also probably explains why he was so willing to let her visit her dad in Father's Day oh. because he was probably testing her to see if he had groomed her well enough. Oh my lord! And why he was so cranky when she went she went and saved his dad. Oh, that is such a problematic storyline. Yeah. yeah, so I'm glad they I'm glad they got rid of that. Oh, me too. Oh, that would have been terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's apparently I don't know what the actual episode was about, but that was that's apparently the part that Russell T Davies was like, mm, I don't I don't think so. Yeah, the man who created the. Father Aliens and had Rose say that you're so gay. Uh, thought it was a little bit too much. We don't want that. And I remember Sylvester McCoy's doctor. He was always manipulating Ace, and I found that really annoying after a while. I haven't seen any of his. Oh, uh, he, you know, he took it to some house where oh, yes. she burnt it down. That was the ghost. I can't remember what it's called. Ghostlight. Ghostlight, kind of manipulating with her her mother and... eh. And let me just say, this to me, this does feel like a filler episode. It was tacked on afterwards, but I don't want to reveal my hand too early. Let's uh, let's get into it. All right. In an office in Cardiff, a scientist brings his concerns to Mayor Margaret Blaine over a new nuclear power plant to be built there. It is dangerous, almost as if it has been intentionally built to explode. I love that they, they try and explain it later where they're basically like, oh, there's a curse about yeah. all the people who have died. But if no one has signed off on this power plant, why is it going ahead? Well, you I know? like the way she says, oh, she says we're in Wales. We could fall off the edge of the map, <laughs> map and they wouldn't know. In but they've had multiple safety checks. Yeah. This dude as well, like like the fact is that they would have no one have signed off on the thing, but everybody who goes to check it out dies. I love that. I love it when she's explaining all the deaths later. Yeah. It was a very icy patch. 
<laughs> one of them she yeah, one of them she runs over. Yeah. Oh, a visibility was low. Wouldn't you kind of get a little bit suspicious when one of them gets like run over by the mayor? <laughs> Margaret asks him if he has told anyone else about his findings. He replies that he did not and instead went directly to her. Of course. She commends him for making the right choice as she apparently and very audibly experiences some gas. <laughs> as the scientist... Thankfully no farting. No, though. no. Just, this... just a little bit of a oh, stomach gas. I know. As the scientist expresses his relief that Blaine will shut down the project, she reveals herself to be... A Slavine, Slavine, <laughs> and kills the scientist. He lies, though. He doesn't say, oh, yeah, but I put all my information up on the internet. Well, thank God he did. You know the internet, that new thing that the kids are using these days? I used my Alta Vista account to uh, upload <laughs> it to the internet. It's on GeoCities if you want to check it out. <laughs> I'm glad that he did pop it up there. But, uh, yeah, the actor who plays Mr Cleaver, mm. William Thomas, has previously appeared as Martin the Undertaker in Remembrance of the yes. Daleks. Part 2, 1988. And this made him the first performer to appear in both the original and the current runs of Doctor Who. And he played Gwen Cooper's father in Torchwood. Oh, yeah. yeah. So he might be the first person who's appeared on the Classic Who, Modern Who and Torchwood. Wow. If we could have got him on the Sarah Jane Adventures, there it would have go. been the whole franchise. And class. Remember class? Oh, God. I watched no, it. Yeah, no one remembers class. No. I haven't seen it. Russell T Davies wrote this episode to bring back Annette Badland as Margaret Blaine or Blonde Fell Foch Passima de Slovene. He must have really loved his creation of the Slovene to bring them back. Well, it was due to her performance in Aliens of London and World War Three, and he thought she was brilliant, even though she only had a few lines. Oh, look, I'll give you that. A she chicken was, in my yeah. boob. Oh, God. <laughs> That she line. Was, yeah, she was great. The lines were trash. Just like having to edit that episode in the last week, that line multiple <laughs> times over and over yeah. again, Adam going, shaking my booty. I'm just like, oh, God. Kill but me the out. way she delivers it, it's like she knows that <laughs> this, is I'm a in a sh- this is a camp, camp line. <laughs> I'm shaking my booty. But I've got to say, out of all of them, She's the one I remembered from the episode, the two-parter. Oh, yeah, definitely. She's, yeah. She was the standout for me. And I've seen her in a few things since, and I can't look at her as anything else but Margaret Blaine. Oh, that would be interesting. Yeah. I've never seen her in anything she else. She was in Russell T Davies' kids' show Wizards and... Wizards of Waverly Wizards Place. and Aliens, I think. Wow, that's oh, a reference right. I didn't think you would know. <laughs> Wizards oh. of Waverly Place. No, no, that's American, I think. Hey, I've had to look up Selena Gomez to see who she is. Oh, really? <laughs> Oh, she was in the she was in the Muppets movie, and really? it was so it was so funny because they were made a joke about like you know everyone knows who you are, Miss Selena Gomez, and I was like I don't know who the hell that person is, and then they had the kid from Modern Family, and all the kids in the audience were like Yeah, that guy, but oh. the joke was like I don't know who you are, <laughs> but that was the only kid that ev- everyone in the audience knew who who they wow. were. Wow, I only know of because. Because she went out with Justin Bieber and I must have read <laughs> oh, it yes. in like a magazine at the hairdressers or somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. She's yeah, a singer? Yeah, like a decade ago. Yeah, she's a Disney singer like oh. like Demi Lovato, Miley Cyrus, Jonas Brothers. Oh, okay. they're, they're from the same sort of group. Same cookie cutter. Same yep. cookie cutter. The Doctor lands the TARDIS over the Cardiff Rift using slow radiation leakage to recharge it. As the process will take a whole day, he, Rose and Jack are joined by Mickey Smith and take the opportunity to explore the area. They couldn't have picked up Mickey on the way? Well, I don't think they knew he was coming, did they? Didn't Rose oh, kind Rose of... Oh, Rose invited him? I think Rose kind of <laughs> sprung it on him. Is he going to give the doctor some petrol money for picking him up on the long, yeah. the long the way? I love the banter in the TARDIS. Yeah. When they first get there, you know, off into time and space. Yeah. Oh, they're very Scooby Gang. The yeah. three of them, uh, they have to have had other adventures. They're all tight knit and everything. Yeah. And Mickey's really on the outside. Except when they're having like lunch. Yeah. He's in, he's in on it. I thought, oh, he's going to be like, oh, you don't. Go. But he's in on the joke. He does the punchline to. Um, yeah, to Jack's to joke. To Jack's joke. And I'm yeah. like, how does he know what the punchline is? Because obviously it's a very old joke, Jack. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but then for the rest of the episode, he's like, no, you guys don't include me. Like, you look like you were getting along so very well. Yeah. But I like it when he calls the Doctor Big Ears and he doesn't like Jack, the captain of the innuendo squad. <laughs> <laughs> Later in the series, they have like cute little nicknames for each other. Like Captain Jack calls Mickey Mickey Mouse, and then Mickey calls Captain Jack Captain Cheesecake. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
I kind of think that there's a bit of respect that's gained over time between them. But but then the episode, Mickey's again like, no, I don't want to go travelling with you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, there was some satisfying bits for me at the end of this, for Mickey and the Mickey and Rose thing, but then it just kept sort of going. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a weird thing, but... I thought the the banter was good. They look like they're all having a great time. It's it's kind of how I would imagine it'd be in the TARDIS, you know. Woo! Yay! Yeah, <laughs> Captain Jack cr- cracking on to both, yeah. both of them. Yeah, God knows whose bed he'll be creeping into tonight. <laughs> 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 but I love it when they go then to the restaurant and they're having a great time and Jack's telling his hilarious story. And then they see Margaret on the front page of the paper. Now I want to I want to talk about this. I rewatched the episode again like mm. a couple of weeks ago. And can I ask what the timeline of this photo is? Because okay, six there, months of that photo of that one photo. Oh, I don't know. First of all, because okay, so we see Margaret Blaine showing off her PowerPoint thing, which everyone must already know about. And then a photographer takes her photo, and she's like, "Ah, oh, don't take my photo with her hand up." Basically, yeah. now that is the exact photo we see in the newspaper. Yeah, but I assumed that she does that for every photo. Ah, so it was just because I was thinking one of the few times someone else. The guy takes a photo, rushes the photo (laughs) off, sends it to them. They write an article, they put it in the paper, they print the paper, they deliver the paper. Someone buys the paper, and then the guy's sitting there reading it. I was like, what? is going on. This is insane. <laughs> no, I just imagined that it was an earlier photo of right. her and that's pretty much she doesn't want her photo, obviously. Also, how did she become mayor if she didn't li- doesn't like photos being taken? Well, yeah, that's that's an interesting thing. But remember, she, Margaret Blaine, was the head of the Secret Service. Yeah. So I don't know. That's another thing I want to ask. They say it's only been six months since mm. the last one. They don't want it two years since uh, Rose has been taken. Oh, yeah, yeah. So in six months... She's been involved in a scandal at the uh, number 10, right? Yeah. Yep. She's quit from MI5. She's moved to Wales. Yep. Conveniently, they need a new mayor. Mm-hmm. So she's gone through that mayoral <laughs> process. She's been elected and, and built a and nuclear and power put plant. put a proposal in to build a <laughs> nuclear power plant. Not just a nuclear power plant. They say they're tearing down Cardiff Castle. Why is Cardiff Castle not a heritage list- listed place? According to Margaret, they don't need it. I don't. <laughs> All in six months. Well, she, if you were stuck in a dead end place, say you're stuck in Dolby for six months and the only way to get out is to build a nuclear power plant and burn up the place, you'd be pretty motivated to get that done in six months. I'm sure she's motivated. I'd do it in two weeks. Uh, There's so much much political red tape. She gets more done in six months than most politicians get done their entire career. Well, that's because she actually wants to achieve something most politicians don't. (laughs) Not only, not only, like puts forward the proposal to build a power station, gets everyone to somehow approve it. Like they're thinking of putting a zip wire over Cardiff Bay, and it's it's six months of friggin' people oh, no. complaining about oh, it, no. and the things the things a year and a half away. I'm confused. Zip wire? Oh, it was our news from uh, from a previous episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah They're oh, building so, a zip wire. So the one that I wasn't here for. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah, that was the funniest, the best. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you oh. really missed out. Oh. So hilarious. Oh God. Oh, <laughs> Don't I, let her edit. No, She'll no. laugh too much. <laughs> You're not allowed to listen to it either. I ban you. <laughs> We're kidding. So yeah, We're so there's kidding. there's a few uh, yes. few things about this episode I don't fully understand. <laughs> yes, the, the time the timelines are sped up quite considerably. Oh, yes. So I put it that way that if I was say stuck in Dolby, no offence Dolby, well, actually plenty of offence Dolby, I would find a way to get out as soon as possible, so yeah. I mean, she does say that, oh, we're in Wales and no one cares about us, but mm. then they obviously care enough to keep sending, you know, hey, you're building a power station. Yeah. European inspectors yeah. from the European Union. Yeah. Anyway, so the doctor notices the headline, new mayor, new Cardiff. Oh, dear. Next, we go to a press conference that you talked about where Margaret's doing her little, you know, PowerPoint display. It's good to have a PowerPoint display instead of feel like we're going to get one. So that was nice. And she is uh, approached by a young reporter named Kathy Salt. And she wants to talk to her about... Kathy the- Salt? Is that her name? Yeah. Salt. Yeah. Is her husband's name Pepper? Yes, Pepper Salt. Pepper Salt. Yes. What's wrong with the last name Salt? I don't it's know. It's better just- than Smallcock or something like that, isn't <laughs> that, it? That's a question for Angelina Jolie in that movie, Salt. Ah. Was her last name Salt? I think so. I think uh, that's why I was called. I just salt. never. I've never heard of someone with the name Salt. Oh, before. 
Oh, well, there you go. Wouldn't Are you salty about salt? Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get off. Yeah. <laughs> like, she's a reporter. She's been investigating. Wouldn't she be like, oh, yeah, by the way, everyone who's ever spoken to you turns up dead? Well, she's trying to get on, stay on her good side to get a story, isn't she? I mean, you can't go up and go, you're a liar, you're... Yeah. because they won't interview you then. She's just trying to get it. So she's talking to her about the deaths and sort of a trail of information that's been left behind. Margaret thinks uh, she should have a word, they should have a word in private. Then we hear the loud rumble. No oh. farting in this, thank God. Her belly gives her an excuse to go to the toilet. And she goes, I love that. All girls together. <laughs> she takes her into the toilet. That sound was coming out of the cubicle next to me. I would get up and yeah, walk no, out no immediately. No farting, but sounds. Oh. They, they try and condense it down to like a large sh- shitting scene. Oh, it's horrible. Oh. <laughs> Kathy notes that when they get there, they got there just in time. Blonde gets out of her skin suit and, of course, she plans to kill poor little Kathy. But she has a change of heart when Kathy starts talking about her fiance and her unborn child. That was strange. Have you ever been in a situation where you followed someone to the toilet and while they're shitting their guts out, you're like, oh, I'm pregnant with child and going to get married. You'd be surprised and... what girls tell each other oh, in public yeah. toilets. Thank disgusting, you very much. Disgusting. I get That's where you make some of your best friends. Yeah, on a, especially on a, when you're drunk. A drunk Saturday, Friday night in the line to the toilet, you get to hear everybody's <laughs> mm-hmm. drama. I love Margaret explaining all the deaths. As as Kathy's running running through them, and they're just getting more and more implausible, but it's really quite a nice comic little thing. It was an icy patch. He was decapitated. It was a very, very icy patch. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. Visibility was low. <laughs> all the people got electrocuted. Wouldn't you think that there'd electric- be there'd be at least one like overweight person in this group of people she killed? She could like inhabit them for a little <laughs> bit and be like, "Oh yes, everything's totally safe. Don't worry about it." Well, she would have had she had her brothers. I, I do. Yeah. Well, I she, do yeah, like she, that moment in the toilet where you see that she's very lonely. You know, she's lost all of her brothers and and blah blah blah. And then she lets Kathy go. And I, I kind of I liked that moment. It was a little small redeeming bit of Margaret Blaine. I did start to feel a little bit of sympathy towards Margaret Blaine until the doctor does remind you, you murdered someone Mm. so you could live in their skin. You're talking through a dead woman's lips. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's right. Mm. Yeah, she's Mm. terrible. I know, I know. It's this overarching thing with with sci-fi in particular where they usually have like a monster of a character who then shows a little bit of good and everyone's like, yay, they're good now. Yeah, Like yeah. Star Wars where everyone's like, oh, in the next one, Kylo Ren might become good. Yeah. And it's like, it doesn't matter. He's murdered yeah. hundreds of people. His own father. He's, yeah, he's murdered his own father. Spoilers for yeah. Star Wars. You just you spoiled it for me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> his father is Luke Skywalker. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, he's murdered hundreds of people. And if he is good once, yeah. you guys are like, yay, he's part of our side now. It's like, no, lock him up and throw away the key. Okay, so when, let me give you an example. When you're a parent and you have children and you will have, you usually have at least one giving you trouble at at any one time. But if you have one consistently sort of giving you a bit of trouble and then they do something really good for the first time in six months, you go, yay, (laughs) yay, yay. And then they go bad again for six months and then they do something good. You go, yay. But Kylo Ren doesn't have any parents anymore. (laughs) Oh. Well, that's why he's so sad and, and so bitter. And I'm questioning where I got the children from. Oh, yeah. well, I'm just saying, if you do, you will just notice that uh, you'll just be pleased for any good behaviour you get out of <laughs> so him. So I, I think the Doctor is 100% justified to take Margaret Blaine back to Raxacalico Fallopatorius. Where she's going to get the death penalty. But that's not the Doctor's fault, though. Yeah, but some countries have the death penalty, but if Australians get caught over there, we want them back here because we don't want them killed under the death penalty but she's because from we don't Raxicalico- believe it. Raxicalico- Caraco Pelopatorius. Yeah, she knows know. what it's like. Yes, she was forced into that life. You're very, but... uh, you're very uh, harsh. Well, she was forced into that life of killing right, but mm. it's her decision to kill the entire planet of Earth to try and get away from it. Well, that's true. She could have lived her entire life on Earth waiting for a chance to get out without killing everybody, but she plans to kill the entire planet. She's not a good person. No, she's not. But I, I did have a mild tinge of sympathy for her when I found out she's all alone. I particularly love when they go in to corner her. So Jack, Captain Jack, the Doctor and Rose and Mickey all exit one, exit two, exit three, exit four. Jack organises the plan. I love the way the Doctor goes, who's in charge here? <laughs> and then he goes, oh, what he said. Poor old Mickey still gets to be the comedy relief, jumps in a bucket and Margaret gets away. This is the other thing that annoys me. He's on exit four and the Doctor's like, who was on exit four? Mickey was on exit four, it's his fault. 
No, no, she yeah. escaped because she got past the three of you yeah. and went down an alleyway. Mickey then comes out of Exit 4. He's on Exit 4. Yeah. She doesn't come out of Exit 4. <laughs> no. She comes out of Exit 1, the one that the doctor's on, and she runs away from the doctor. And it's Mickey not Mickey's gets fault. The, Mickey gets the blame. Oh, so I dumb. just, I just love the way he's just tell her the doctor's here. And you hear the cup drop. <laughs> just, the mare's very busy. She's climbing out the window, isn't I she? I love that, yes. That was <laughs> yes, great. Yes, she is. <laughs> but then the strange thing is when, when Margaret's getting away, the aide comes out and he's like, leave the mayor alone. Yeah. I'm like, oh, Jesus. How invested in this guy is in the mayor? I, I don't th- want to have to find a new job. <laughs> oh, that was hilarious. And she's just down the ladder and yeah. off she goes. Because I'm assuming that he would think, oh, she's uh, she's done something illegal or something. And you'd be like, oh. It's not my not my job. I'll let uh, you know. I don't know, but I just love the fact that she just runs straight out of the uh, out of the building. That's hilarious. <laughs> She's hitting the teleport on her earring. Comes back. Yeah, it keeps coming back. I like it. He goes, I can do this all day. <laughs> and that's and that's a reference to the second episode where they bring back uh, Cassandra. Cassandra and yeah. Rose goes, Oh, he's very good at teleport. Oh, yeah, I did yeah, like yeah, that. I like that. He's very good at teleports. This is when they find out that uh, this is how Margaret escaped. From 10 Downing Street with her teleporter and she ended up in a skip on the Isle of Dogs, which yes. apparently was hilarious and everyone's laughing about that. It takes a bit of investigating to find out what the Isle of Dogs is. Yeah, what is the Isle of Dogs? If you type in Isle of Dogs, it just brings up the uh, the animated movie that Wes Anderson did. Ah. But basically it's a, it's a little part of, of London, like just a little bit away from London, kind of near um, – anyway, don't worry about it. I can't remember the name of it. Oh. I, d- I didn't look it up. I thought I've got to look that up and then I forgot all about looking but it's, it up. But it's basically in London. Oh, okay. Not directly in London but, but near London. It's like a little inlet. Oh, okay. The Isle of Dogs. Doesn't sound nice. There are a lot of wild dogs there. I have no idea. It's probably just called that. And that's when we then have a look at her little model and Jack finds the extrapolator, the Triboficial waveform macrokinetic extrapolator. I think it's great that in the, the she decides to place the priceless piece of alien technology <laughs> in, in the, the model, model she's she's showing to everybody. <laughs> no. Like, why not keep that at home and just have, like, a model there and be like... Well, I guess they'll put the model in... I don't know. I have no idea yeah, why she's yeah. put it there. And it's not going to be part of the actual... I did think it was a plan. weird place to put it. <laughs> Jack's very excited about the... Uh, pan-dimensional surfboard. Well, he's pan himself. <laughs> well, he is. He's not pan-dimensional, now, but pan other things. I believe when I, I was looking it up, uh, tribophysics is something from the third Doctor. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, the Visitation, part three, 1982. It's the fifth Doctor. Fifth Doctor, He right. was similarly told by an alien that returning them home would... Oh, no, that's about resulting in their death. Sorry. Oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh. I rushed ahead. No, it could have been the third, the third doctor. Yeah, I, I, I read something that, uh, that that's a reference to one of the previous doctors, so that's that's quite cute. That And also then the name of the plant, which is Blythe Droog. Oh, yes. Which is bad. And they wolf. play the... Oh. I know, and then the doctor goes, everywhere we go, following us through time and space. That could just be a coincidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And I think, oh, come on. <laughs> but I did I did like that. And Rose finally getting Raxa Calico Phalopatorius. Much like me. Uh, yes. I'm, wait, am I the Rose? You're Rose. You're the doctor, I'm, I'm the, the Rose. Doctor. Oh, man. You're so in love I with me. I missed the opportunity to have my Time Lord name be Bad Wolf. Oh, <laughs> that would have been good. Oh. It would have made sense. <laughs> this one is obviously the last kind of episode to set up a lot of those things for the finale. So yeah. the heart of the TARDIS. The bad wolf. Yeah, and I, look, I, I think I like that about it, but it's an interesting thing because the doctor says to Blonde, well, I'm going to take you back to Rex Calico Phalopatorius where you can, you know, face trial for your crimes. And she says, well, you know, we've been tried. I'm going to be sent to death. And he goes, well, it's not his problem. Yeah, it isn't. And that's when I was saying in The Visitation Part 3 in 1982, the fifth doctor was similarly told by an alien that returning him home would result in their death. But that time the doctor offered to take the criminal to another planet to avoid the death sentence here's, because he doesn't believe in it. And here's, here's my thing. You can liken that to refugees basically. But if a refugee has done nothing wrong, you know, is just a refugee, but sending them back to their home country would result, mean that they would be persecuted or executed, then fine, keep them here, totally. But we know, we 100% know Margaret Blaine is a murderer. 
she is a bad person mm. and she needs to face up to her crimes. It's an interesting thing. Russell T. Davies wanted the story to examine the moral repercussions of the doctor's deeds. But there is no moral repercussion. Particularly in the context of capital punishment to which Davis was personally opposed. Oh, and don't get me wrong, like I don't I don't think that she you know, I'm not I'm not a fan of capital punishment. If there was a way for her to pay for her crimes and not be executed, then yes. Mm. But they're saying that the two options are one, she goes back to her home planet and gets executed, or two, they let her go. Like, why is that the only other option? Is there not another planet they can take it yeah, to? Surely, the... surely they've committed enough crimes that there's a planet that they can take them to yeah. that where she'll be arrested, yeah. you know? But they don't even look at that. Yeah. They just drop your back and you die and not my problem. I do like that banter between Margaret and the Doctor over that because it is there is a, m- serious repercussions for taking someone to their death. It's a deliberate take you to your death. I don't believe in capital punishment either. I wouldn't have taken her back to Rex Cal- Calico Thalapatorius. Well, I mean, it depends. I would have found something else. It depends because, you know, the way that she says it, it sounds like every member of the, the Slovene family has been tried mm. and will be executed. Mm. It's like, what about the the son that's born now and never meets the rest? Like, that doesn't sit well with me. Well, I suppose all the family Slovene left Rex yeah. Calico Thalapatorius. Yeah. So there'd be none left there anyway. Yeah, but the, I mean, the kids, the kids of serial killers don't get arrested because they're a kid of a serial mm. killer. Just because you're a member of the Slovene family, or is she saying that she personally was mentioned in the death warrant, which means that she has already been tried, and there she, therefore she needs to go. Yeah, and she, face up to she her. must. She must be saying that she's been named. She must in be. It. But the way and she says it, if it they're sounds a criminal like, family, they're bringing up their kids to be criminals as well. Like, yeah. you know, but, she had to do her first kill at whatever age. But I, I would say, I would say that there would still need to be some sort of trial for each individual person mm. to prove that that person is worthy of the death penalty. Unless, you know, we don't know what the, what the Rax Calico Fallopatorius legal system is like. Well, obviously the whole of the Slovenes are going to be killed because that's what she says. So obviously they like to kill people. But they have a legal system. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would love to see a... I'm legally going to kill you. Yeah, I would love to see a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I hope we're having to wear this suit for uh, for court. Oh, rejoice in your body. <laughs> it is magnificent. <laughs> I like their little faces, but that's about it. The rest of them are pretty hideous. Jack recognises that the extrapolator can be used to halve the time to refuel the TARDIS and stays there to install it. Rose and Mickey go out for a drink to discuss their relationship. We're, we're, only, we're not talking a long time. We're talking 12 hours. Like, just... Get some sleep. Get, have a nap, and twelve hours will be gone. Like you don't need to know, need to hook up a piece of technology you've never seen before. <laughs> well, I yeah, I suppose they they're like what does she say? A bow bird mind like yours. Yeah, you know. So she knew that he'd see the tech and go crazy for it. And of course, Jack's just having some sort of orgasm. Over oh the, yeah, over the pan dimensional surfboard. <laughs> so um, Mickey. He invites Rose to a hotel room, but also lets him know that he's seen yeah. Trisha Delaney. Oh, man. Oh, no. So he's loyal to Rose, but not Trisha Delaney. Delaney. Oh, and Trisha Delaney gets a slamming in this yeah, episode. Yeah, she's a bit big, isn't she? Oh, yeah, that's she the first thin. thing. Yeah. <laughs> she lost she right got thin. There. Mickey's response is basically she got thin, so therefore she has value now. Oh, my goodness. And Rose is like, you don't even like her. And it's, and, and it's like, maybe she's a nice person, Rose. <laughs> Jesus. I'm sorry, you're the one who tried to hook up with a, a dude from the friggin' tw- 2012. I like the way Mickey sort of, he says, you know, I can't even go out with a girl at a shop, you know, because you call and here I come. He's so devoted to her. Yeah. And she's, at that point, she's kind of using that. I think she wants to see him just for a play, I don't think for anything. Yeah, well, her response should be, oh, yeah, I don't remember you exist until there's an episode with you in it. But when we're on other planets, Mickey who? Yeah, I know. She has no right to be upset about Trisha Delaney. No, definitely not. Um, you know, so that kind of annoys me. Oh, and she works She works in a shop and that makes her terrible. It's like, oh, excuse me, Rose, you worked in a shop too. Thank you very much. Mickey says that he'd wait for Rose for the rest of his life, which is so sweet. And Rose goes, that's creepy. Get the fuck away from me. Yep. She apologises for... <laughs> We've only been dating for a little bit. 
Oh, well, he's I just he really does love her and she really is not interested. But he should get the hint and be like, okay, well, I fuck think you he then. does at the end of this episode. I, I mean, think he, does he does go traveling with her next season, so yeah, I'm gonna watch that through different lens this time yeah. because I, I saw a bit more in this one that I didn't notice through mul- multifocals, through rose colored glasses. It's like I've said, Mickey is the biggest cuck in the universe, <laughs> yeah, because he's like, oh, yeah, I'm totally over you. Oh, can I watch you with this other man? What, <laughs> yeah, yeah, voyeurism. I didn't see any voyeurism in that. <laughs> It's obvious that Rose is in love with the doctor and he's like, yeah, can I come but... travelling with you? Well, is it the doctor or Jack? But it's obvious that she's in love with the doctor. I think fuck, marry, kill. She would uh, marry the doctor, yeah, fuck, fuck Jack, Jack and, and kill, kill Mickey. Mickey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> But you were just like, oh, yeah, can I watch you with another man? And I was just like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how jokes work. Oh, jokes. Yes, yes. jokes you say yeah. that's how that's how uh, entendres work. Yeah. They're double entendre. Yeah. Or with, in Adam's case, the single. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I'm single. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's a, no, they just. Every, uh, every entendre I make, no matter whether it's double or triple, is single <laughs> because I am alone. It's always single. Oh, <laughs> uh, dear, oh, dear. Actually, I have to say, when they're leaving, Leaving the TARDIS and walking off, she is again. She's very touchy feely with the Doctor. She's hang, you know, head on his shoulder, holding his hand. It's all very. I don't know. It, it all seems like it's developing too quick. Anyway. Oh, but then she has that speech where she's like, if he's been grooming her. Well, oh, she, <laughs> I, I was talking about Margaret when she has that speech where oh. she's like. Let me see who can look me in the eye. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that feels like real filler. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I liked the gravitas of, of everybody. They're taking her to her death. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I think maybe you're looking at it very, a bit more black and white than I am. Yeah. Whereas I'm so against the death penalty that I just wouldn't do it. Well, just I, wouldn't no, take someone. No, but I someone. am too. But if I was there, I would at least suggest, isn't there somewhere we can take her yeah. where she can go and be oh, put yeah. in jail? I wouldn't just leave her there. She's dangerous. But they, they they just keep acting throughout the entire episode like it's either you execute me yourself or you let me go. And it's like, no, mm. those they are acting like it's black and white. And yeah. it isn't black and white as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I think that there are other options they could have had. She, for she has committed crimes. She needs to pay for those crimes. How she pays for those crimes is the spectrum that I would argue on. But when they say that it's basically either you let me go now and let me do whatever I want, and it's mm-hmm. like, no, no, that's ridiculous. Yeah. But then, I, I, I mean, we see it over and over again with the Daleks, where yeah. the doctor goes, oh, can I destroy the Daleks? Oh, yeah. Just get over it and do it. Yeah. I don't know, can you at yeah. this point? But yeah, the, but because we've a... seen you try a few times and you suck at it. Done it multiple times. Yeah, and he sucks at it. He's destroyed them in the Time War, oh, you know. They're oh, like cockroaches. Yeah. But then later on he's like, can I destroy the Daleks again? <laughs> so, well, sometimes you need to, uh, you know, have a few goes at something to get good at it. <laughs> it's like starting a you lawnmower. You can't just get into Wimbledon after your first match, you know. It's you like can't. starting a lawnmower. Yeah. <laughs> Every time you pull the cord, Daleks die. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, come on, next time will work. Next time will work. But you never actually get it going. That's the problem. At the request of Blonde, the doctor joins her for one last meal at her favourite little restaurant, <laughs> equipped with bracelets that will electrocute her if she gets more than 10 feet away from the doctor. I love doctor. that Jack's just got those. Yeah. Oh, yeah, by the way, <laughs> these bondage torture devices. Do you yeah. guys want to use these? I'm pretty sure River would have some as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Blonde attempts, I love her attempts to kill the doctor. Through the different means, you know, with the poison. Every single time he just casually blocks every single attempt. Again, he says at the start of this, oh, I only know about your species from what I've seen. But then he knows everything about them. So either he's seen more than he's letting on. Yeah. Or because he goes, he's playing oh, dumb know. for her. But he must have learnt that in between. Oh yeah. Because then he goes, oh yeah, I only know what I've seen, but I know everything about your female species. Yeah. You know. I think he's saying to her because he wants to see if she'll try and do all these things to escape. Um, and I love it that he just is ready for it and shuts her down. And the the, the acting, her her face when she gets. Shut down all those times. I just love that. I love it. It is pretty good. I thought it was good. Now the restaurant that they go to doesn't exist anymore. Oh no! No, it uh, it turned it changed its name and um, became another restaurant. And I'm unsure if that restaurant still exists. Oh, uh, okay. here we are. Um, restaurant was Bistro Ten. Bistro Ten doesn't exist anymore. It was renamed to something else. Something else. Bellini's, I think, is it was called. The website for Bellini's doesn't work, but there are reviews on Google for it, so it could still oh, be open. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, then later on. Blonde starts trying to get the doctor's sympathy, telling him about her terrible childhood, how she let Kathy Salt go, and 
the doctor, you know, she's not convincing him. But I, I like the banter in that scene very much. Yeah. And the dinner scene between the doctor and Margaret Blaine was filmed while Billy Piper and John Barrowman were filming scenes for The Empty Child. Oh. Um, and this was due to scheduling conflicts with uh, Annette uh, Badland, who played Margaret. Some of the schedule was also rearranged because of the death of Billy Piper's uncle, resulting in her and Eccleston being replaced by doubles during some scenes near the end of the episode. And if you watch it again, some of the distant ones, you can tell that it's their stand-ins. Right. There is a lot of people, like, watching people run from yeah. behind. Yeah, and you yeah. see them running and you can tell that, that it's not. That would make sense. Yeah. Wow, even more of a filler episode. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. So they basically use stock footage. Yeah, so they, they had to... Well, well, they got stand-ins, so you can tell it's not Billy, so it's quite interesting. Margaret Blaine says that as a child she was threatened with being fed to venom grubs. Mm, and venom grubs. they first appeared in the first Doctor serial, The Web Planet. Mm. There you go. But they were only referred to as venom grubs in the novelisation. He knows everything. <laughs> I did research as well. Uh. Uh, so, sometimes I wish, like, the listeners could actually see you guys when you're bickering over who... <laughs> Bickering, the, like over who is the biggest Doctor Who fan? Well, it was actually only in the novelisation. So oh, yeah. from this planet. Oh, don't don't like... get me wrong. Nakia is a hundred percent the the bigger Doctor Who fan. I just happen to know things because I researched the same episode. Like, yeah, so, so we must yeah. look at different websites. Too. So so this this episode, I know a little bit more about you. But if we were talking about any other episode, you would be the bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because one of the things that I really like about it when we do this is you research the episode. You write up the synopsis and stuff, but you research the episode and you find out things that you either don't remember or don't know. Yeah, and I, I like I like those little bits. Yeah, of I do too. Bits, I can go, you know? oh, my God, I remember that in that series. I obviously didn't see the web, <laughs> the first Doctor series at all. I was a little, little young for that. Can I ask why does the Doctor take the cufflinks off, the, the, the bands off the sort because then I don't know because she goes take these off and he goes okay but you're staying near me well why not leave them on then yeah why because you'll be right beside me I don't want you to get away like it doesn't make sense to me no it doesn't but I guess what's she gonna do because she can't hang around there she's created it's gonna blow up yeah she needs the extrapolator and and we know why she she has to take them off so that the doctor doesn't have anything to use against her when she takes Rose hostage but from the story point of view of the doctor it makes no sense it makes no sense you would have just left them on oh totally yeah before he and uh, Margaret finish their dinner and can agree on whether she deserves to be killed or not. Oh, do they have dinner? I thought that the uh, the TARDIS starts exploding. Yeah, there's a large earthquake yeah. shakes and then that's so before they have dinner. So they're off. Um, Once again, the Doctor doesn't get to eat. No. It's like he never gets to eat. <laughs> Does, he must, like, have a vending machine. I'm sure he's got vending machines in the TARDIS. Probably. Has to be. Or maybe, uh, maybe that's why how he keeps so slim. Mm. I think it's funny that um, running and eating nothing. When Rose and Mickey are, are talking, Mickey suggests we could go for pizza. Pizza, <laughs> pizza, pizza. Pizza. They're obsessed with pizza. <laughs> and then go back to the hotel. Yeah. Or do you want to go fuck? <laughs> Does it's very grown up that he says we could go to a hotel? Yeah. And you go, oh, oh, yeah. you know, on Doctor Who, they. It's very grown up, but it's also very like teenager. Like, wow, well, we could go back to a hotel. I got a hotel for us to go to have Aww. sex in. You know, like. I couldn't even afford to pay board at my house when I was a teenager. Oh, I wouldn't pr- be able to afford a hotel. I would say that he's probably using his rent money as well, but it's been yeah. probably been so long. <laughs> they did. They definitely didn't have sex the last time she was there, so no. it's been 18 months. But maybe months. he's been getting it from Trisha. Oh. Maybe, but it's been 18 months since he had sex with Rose. Wow. I want to feel for him, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, no, he's got Trisha Delaney. Okay, the group reassembles in the TARDIS. Jack tells the Doctor that it's the power from the rift drawn by the extrapolation. Blonde reveals that this was her plan all along. The extrapolator would have been found by someone of sufficiently advanced technology to recognise the Slovene and would have activated it, causing it to lock onto the nearest alien power source, the TARDIS, tear open the rift and eventually the Earth, while she had ridden the... What does she call it? The surfboard. That's written the surfboard straight through the destruction and to safety. That's such a 60s mentality, like that period of time where the silver surfer was created. Yeah. And it's like <laughs> aliens will be on surfboards <laughs> because surfboards will always be cool. Of course they will always be cool. <laughs> yes, always. Yes. 
Just ask Moondoggy. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know who Moondoggy is. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. That's all right. Just watch a Gidget movie. Um, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, you need to explain that reference yeah. as well. Uh, g- what's, what's Gidget? Really? Yeah. You've never seen Gidget? No. no. So Gidget is – Sally Fields was Gidget when she was really young. Okay. I know um, who Sally Fields is. And uh, also Sandra Dee played Gidget in the movies. And Gidget was a, a girl who was a midget, a little girl. Not not a midget, but they that's what they called her. Shorter than normal, right? Yeah. Oh no, just little. Just a, a petite girl. But she wrote a surfboard. And right. so that was really like unusual. Elvis movie sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm pretty sure her her boyfriend was um Moondoggy. Moondoggy. Yeah, he was Gidget he was, and Moondoggy. He was like the king of the waves. But he didn't have blonde Moondog. hair, he had the black so hair. So the king of the waves is dating a little girl who is pretending to be a midget. No, 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 no. She's she's a petite girl. Her name is I can't remember, but they all is she an call adult her, or a girl? She's about eighteen, maybe a bit younger, sixteen, yeah, yeah, yeah. seventeen. Like those, like those Elvis movies where everyone's like, like young, Annette Benning and old the, enough for you to uh, to fantasize. About. Bobby Darren <laughs> movies, yeah. <laughs> Sally Fields was the original Gidget that I saw, and I loved the Gidget movies. She was just, she was kind of cool. Can I just go back? Did you say Sandra D played her in in a movie? Yeah, I'm pretty sure she Isn't did. Isn't Sandra D a Grease character? Mm, no, it's in the song look at oh, me I'm Sandra D right okay I've never seen Grease so oh, there you go. I, I thought it was I thought it was a character in that movie oh really you know it's funny with Grease we watched it as kids and we had the music track and we used to they used to play it in our primary school bus and we'd sing along not realizing how rude the songs yes. were yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> until I got older and went <laughs> what do you mean the chicks will cream I don't get that <laughs> oh my god it's in the words to grease light yeah yeah it is and uh, yeah it was karaoke favorite yeah yeah mm. um <laughs> She's a real mm. pussy wagon, that one. <laughs> so, oh, my God. It's all in there. So it's like it's like uh, Rocky Horror where they talk yeah. about Faye Ray. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, so Sandra D. So there you there, There's a completely off, <laughs> off the planet <laughs> reference. Yeah, that's Tell me more about Gidget. Gidget. I'll do my Gidget tell podcast. Tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> Did you get very far? <laughs> I do like it. Come on, Rose. I'm trying to... Pilot the TARDIS here. What are you doing? Oh, Is that God. what he calls it? Okay, Blonde takes Rose hostage. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. That was why the handcuffs were removed, yep. which is very frustrating. Uh, she demands the extrapolator or she's going to kill But she also, she also reveals that, you know, like obviously we keep forgetting, she's wearing a skin suit. So couldn't she have just ripped off the, the skin with the, the bracelet and be like, ah, oh, now I'm free? No, uh, must have been too tight. Maybe. But she got one arm out. Does she get a head out there? She does, doesn't she? It's a head and an arm she's got No, out. no, it's just the arm. So she must have zippers in her arm. She, she no, makes... no, she rips the, she rips the flesh oh. off. She like makes ripping not... skin look really easy. Yeah. 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 Well, you don't you don't want it to be all bloody and stuff. But yeah, yeah. She basically just rips the skin off. Oh, yeah. If this doesn't work, she can't. Have you ever done that for a good on. sunburn? <laughs> Let's just rip it I've off. I wanted to. Oh, God, I hate being sunburnt. The doctor warns her that this isn't just any ship her device is latched upon. This is the TARDIS. Mm. Not that Blonde seems to have any sort of, ooh, she's like, <laughs> ooh, the TARDIS. Ooh, it's so good. And she looks into the heart of the TARDIS and then she smiles. I love that she goes, you're such a bower bird mind. Ooh, shiny. Yeah, shiny, shiny. The light gets very bright on her so, face. So creepy. And she dreamily looks at it and then she says, thank you. And the light overtakes her and her skin suit falls empty to the console floor. And the doctor manages to felt- close the TARDIS console and reseal the lift rift. She has felt the sweet release of death. <laughs> reseal <laughs> The rift once more. <laughs> the image of her like looking in the heart of the TARDIS is all washed out is so creepy. Yeah, it was. She is really creepy as a character. She really does those weird sort of mad eyes really well. I really I kind of liked that. It was a nice ending to it. In in reality, the TARDIS is saving Rose. Because it doesn't need it doesn't need Rose to stop the power thing happening. Because, you know, that'll mm. happen any – well, I suppose – well, I suppose because they're threatening Rose. She, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know. And also it, it opens up because of the extrapolator and the force of the rift and, and blah, blah, blah. And obviously we, we know it takes a lot to get the top of the console open, we've seen. Barring this episode and obviously next episode and the episode after that, 
we never see this power that the TARDIS does ever again. No, we don't. And I don't remember seeing it beforehand either. So yeah, so it's just something that's added for this episode and then never Well, then with again. Peter Capaldi's or with Matt Smith's, it was the gel, the psychic gel in the TARDIS that yeah. you could plug into. So Well, I they suppose they didn't own. want every every monster to be like, hey, do you want to come on the TARDIS? Open up the heart of the TARDIS, <laughs> turn them into a baby, take them back. <laughs> Oh, man, this is so much easier than what I used to do. Yes, when they investigate the bodysuit or the skin suit, they find a Slovene egg, which is very ugly. Yes, it has like little very things ugly. dangling off it. The doctor sur- surmises that the TARDIS is telepathic. It may have sensed that Blonde wanted a second chance and it gave it to her. And as they prepare to travel to Raxacorico, Fallopatorius, to deliver the egg, Rose realised that Mickey has left. The doctor offers to wait, but Rose lets him go. They were in the middle of a huge disaster. As far, as far as Rose knows, he's dead. Well, that's true. She has <laughs> she has no idea. And she just goes back to the TARDIS. She's like, no, nah, don't worry about it. It'll be fine. Yeah. Imagine if she comes back and she's like, oh, where's Mickey? You know, he left us. Oh, like, he's been missing. He's dead. Like... Oh, shit, maybe I should have gone looking for him. I like that she didn't. I felt like he got some closure. Oh, narratively, And I, she I like realises yeah. what she's done to him by her, you know, come here, come here, come here, go away, go away, come here. But come that's here, okay because we know that Mickey's not dead. I'm saying she doesn't have confidence. No, she has he's, no idea. He's not dead. He so, could be dead and she just yeah. buggers off. Yeah, if you if it was a real-life situation, you'd be like, I actually, actually, I actually want to know if he's dead or not, you know. Wow, she really doesn't give a shit, does she? No. Mickey could be dead. Uh, look, I'm busy. Uh, I'll just get in the town. From a woman who in the first episode was all upset that the doctor had not told her that he could have been alive and a copy had been made, and now she's like, eh, could be dead. Who cares? <laughs> I don't know. I Isn't mean, that the way with everyone's ex, though? Well... <laughs> Could be well, dead. Who cares? But poor old Mickey, you know, he's got on a train. He's come all the way here to give her a passport she didn't really need yeah. because she called. Probably had plans with good old Trisha Delaney. I'm um, going to go to Carter for a couple of days. Yeah, Trisha's at home eating her feelings, you know, putting back that way. <laughs> it's all going bad. <laughs> I, just, I just think Rose needs to think of the repercussions of just popping in to Mickey's life. And we're, we're supposed to believe that Rose does that because she cares, she actually cares about Mickey. I think she does it because she's like, oh, yep, the leash is uh, real tight on that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a bit of cares and a little bit of that 19 year old pride that this is mine. I don't really want it, but I don't want anything else, anyone else to have it that you kind of go through. <laughs> it's, I'm not playing with it, but nor can anyone else. It would be good to see Mickey actually. You know, man up and yeah. be like, because for him it's way longer. For him, it's been six another six months since he's seen her. Yeah, the last time for her, it's been a couple of days. And he, yeah, I mean, he does try that. He's like, oh, I'm dating someone else, but I still love you. Like, yeah. and I and I get that. I do yeah. get that. But yeah, we've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> At that <laughs> point in your life. Let, let's just say that his therapy sessions are going to be <laughs> fucked up. First of all, because you need to find a therapist who understands what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, and so, who believes you and doesn't put yeah. you, get you committed. Hopefully Unit gives him a little bit of uh, therapy before he marries Martha oh. because otherwise that is not going to end well. And the thing is, you know, that he left her with the doctor. Now she's got some other stud prancing around the TARDIS. You know, I mean, Jack's pretty intimidating if you were Mickey. Oh, 100%. Rose yeah. and Jack have had sex. A hundred percent. Oh, oh Jack, my Jack's God. had sex with everybody. Yeah. I wouldn't put it past him. No, no, me either. She was already wet for him. <laughs> oh, my God. In, in the two episodes that they were. And, you know, the doctor can't keep an eye on her forever. Um. <laughs> Well, would he want to? <laughs> would the doctor want to? Yeah, and he can keep an eye on her forever if he's been grooming her since oh, she was God. 10. <laughs> or if he's got a camera. <laughs> I, but I would suggest that Rose at some point would be like, oh, I'm really tired, I need to go to bed. And she goes to bed and Jack goes, oh, I'm also really tired, I need to go to bed. <laughs> and they would meet up and they'd have sex and the doctor would be like, damn it! <laughs> You got I, to it before I did. I never see that coming. <laughs> Neither did Rose. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's why he leaves Jack at the end there because he'd, he'd already humped Rose and he didn't want that happening again. <laughs> Jack turns up and the doctor's there with a shotgun like, yeah. don't hire sex with my daughter. <laughs> that's get, the one thing I need to ask you. <laughs> you get away from my companion. Yeah. <laughs> she, I groomed her. She's mine. This here's my wife and my sister. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back up there, Captain Jack. <laughs> 
if you have sex with her, she's tainted, and that yeah. means I need to go to one of the 33 other women <laughs> I've groomed. Thank God I didn't just pick one. It's a lonely life being the doctor <laughs> when you can take anybody in space and time with you in the TARDIS. And you only pick 19-year-olds. Creepy. Uh, and that's it. That's the end of the episode. It is the end of the episode. Anything else we'd like to mention? Other thing I want to mention is that um, the TARDIS... When it's uh, taking in the force of the rift, looks like a uh, looks like the main scene out of Ghostbusters. Oh yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> I think the I think people will notice a Tardis ghost busting all over the city. Well, I was just uh, watching an old episode of I was watching an episode of Sliders, which is an old. Oh, I show. love Sliders. Yeah, I, I did too until they changed the main characters. Yeah, I watched the first season when they just went to random places. Yeah, and then I think it was the second season where they tried to add in like, oh, there's a bad, bad guy alien, following yeah, us and. Yeah. And shit. I only watched intermittently after that. So I did too. And, and so it's being repeated. So I've started watching oh, cool. it again. The light as they jump through the wormhole. And that kind of reminded me of that. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. It's 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 obviously that's kind of influenced by the, the yeah. time vortex thing, yeah. I thought the special effects were good. I thought it was um, interesting. If it was a filler episode, it was a very interesting one. It was. To me, there's a lot about it that doesn't feel like it was up to the same level as the other episodes. Even Aliens of London World War Three, which is terrible, has a bunch of terrible yeah. ideas in it, feels like it's at least something that that someone had an idea from the start, they worked it all the way through and they went, yep, this is yeah. a finished product. Whereas this episode feels like, oh, shit, we need to put an episode together and I feel like it could have taken another couple of drafts mm. to, like, tighten it up. And But it has some. it does have some interesting... Ideas. Yeah, I I enjoyed it much more than I thought I would. I really loved the dialogue and I think that Russell T Davies for me does something like this or Midnight beautifully. I thought the dialogue was fantastic. And I didn't like the dialogue in Aliens of London or World War II. Oh, no, neither did I. Um, yeah, but it's, I it's really better, enjoyed for me it's the better dialogue. than those episodes. Yeah, me but too. It's not still not great. But I'm finding that for this whole season. It'll be interesting to see what we give it because we might be a bit further apart than we think. Okay, well, let's uh, let's go with that. Is there anything you'd like to bring up, Beck? No. <laughs> All right, well, that's Beck's contribution for this episode. Thank you very much. Uh, You're thanks welcome. for showing up. <laughs> Score out of five. Look, I I really did enjoy it. Okay. I felt the tension in it. I loved those moments where there was gravi- gravitas in the discussions over dinner. The moment with the reporter, there was a little bit of fun and banter in it, but there were some problems with the story. But I've gone a four. Okay, radio. I at the end of it, I went, oh wow, I love that. That's a five. I enjoyed it so much. And then I went back and watched it again and went, okay, there are a few problems with some of the story, but it, it was nearly a four point five. But it's a four. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I've yeah. really enjoyed. I really enjoyed it. Okay, I was really I get surprised. That. I, I and I also enjoyed this episode more than Aliens of London and mm. World War Three, which is it's it, interesting. Usually when I give an episode a score, I don't go and look at what other people have given the episode because I don't mm. want it to taint it. But I. I just I was unsure what to give it, you know. Mm. For me, it was a lot lower than that. It was either going to be a lot lower than that or just lower than that. So basically, I was going to give it a two or a three. But I remembered I gave Aliens of London a two because it had that great bit at the start. And yeah. so I went and I had a look at what other people had said. And there's quite a few places where people have ranked Aliens of London and World War Three better than this one, Ugh. which I find very surprising because this is this is definitely a better episode than mm. those two. But they say, oh, there's a lot of good things in Aliens of London World War Three to explore. They just weren't explored very well. Well, that's how I feel about this episode. And that concept of the consequences of the Doctor's actions is explored way better in later seasons. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. It and I is. feel like they don't actually get to the crux of it which is what happens when the Doctor doesn't make sure that the threat has been neutralised. That's something that they could have explored because he went, yep, everything's fine went away, well, it turns out one of them was still there yeah. and they're still affecting human, you know, part. Yeah, so, yeah, I mean, that's true. I think it's the first time that you do start to look at the Doctor's lifestyle and it's that great contrast between all the banter and the jokes and then you've actually taking someone to their death and there's those conflicting emotions yeah. where you're laughing and having fun and then you're thinking, oh, wow, this is kind of serious. And it shows you that what the doctor does, yes, it's fun, yes, it's this, but there's also a serious side to it. So yeah, yeah. and I think I think there's a like you know there's a lot of good parts of the good ideas in the episode that aren't explored as well as they are later on in later episodes. Yeah. I feel like they had the idea of the dinner scene, which was actually a lot shorter than what I remembered. 
Yeah. I thought there was a little bit more back and forth between the two of them and there isn't. I think I would have liked more in the dinner scene. Oh, definitely. Scene. Yeah, I, definitely. I really did feel like I could have done more for that. And moments like where uh, she goes, oh, who can look me in the eye? Well, I don't think they had built up to that moment, you know. Yeah. It had basically just been a lot of Margaret Blaine telling the other characters, you're sending me to your to my death, blah, 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 and not having the other characters explore that between themselves. Yeah, of like, yeah that's true. Everyone that's was true. just like, this is what the Doctor says, this is what we'll do. You know, nobody was like, hey, actually, should, you know, mm. do we have the right to do mm. this, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it, it does feel like a rushed episode, feels like a filler episode. For me, it's going to be a three. It's not, mm. a, it's not an amazing episode. I was actually going to go thinking of going lower rather than higher. Because, oh, really? Yeah. But I do like this more than Aliens of London. I think it's a more well-rounded episode than Aliens of London, which, was, which only got a two because of the fantastic first ten minutes. Otherwise, that would have been a one. Oh, it's horrible. But there are so many I haven't enjoyed coming back to it. Oh, me too, yeah. So this one really sort of stood out for me. And to me, I saw the beginnings, the kernels of the seeds – for Midnight. I haven't really seen it in that. a while, but yeah, oh. I do remember. What we're discovering is this this season doesn't hold up as well as we remember it. And if this had been the only season of modern Doctor Who, how disappointing would that have been? We probably wouldn't be doing this podcast, no. but we would be doing a podcast being like, oh, remember that shit season one that didn't go anywhere? Yeah. Oh, there were a couple of good ones, but most of it didn't yeah. work. Yeah. But, but the fact that it is a starting point for where we go from here, mm. I'm willing to give it a bit of leeway because it was BBC obviously didn't want to throw a lot of money at it. They didn't know if it was going to work. Yeah. And now it's a huge juggernaut, which they're still trying to, you know. Yeah, but save they're the still not on. putting it on yeah. straight away. Yeah, 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 exactly. If it had been just one and done, and then. That would have been so sad because I think you would have missed out on David Tennant. You would have missed out on Matt Smith, Peter Capaldi. Like we would have been talking about this season like we talk about the, the movie. movie. Some people would be like, oh, actually, I really liked it. And you'd be like, what are you talking about? It's crazy. We've got other things to compare it to, compare yeah. it to or measure it against, where if it was all you had. You'd go, well, it was close enough. I wouldn't be saying Russell T Davies is like my one of my favourite showrunners if mm. it was just this season because he created the farting aliens for fuck's sake. <laughs> oh, Come on. We if know that he creates kid. amazing characters, but God. De- yeah, and it's it's but it is a kid thing, but it's yeah. like overtly kid. Yeah. It's like making a Blue Peter version of Doctor Who. Yeah, I mean, they're never going to be my favourite. No. It's my favourite planet name ever, but <laughs> they're never going to be my favourite. It's like if the Daleks had come back and he made, oh, every time they move, they fart. Yeah. Fart, 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 <laughs> exterminate, exterminate. Fart, and it's like, oh, exterminate. okay. Yeah. You do need to take it a little bit seriously sometimes. Or the Cybermen, maybe, <laughs> where they took out all your emotions but not your farty stuff. <laughs> So you can fart but never laugh and enjoy it. Oh, God, why? Or the, the weeping angels. Don't blink also. The farting, or fart, also the farting don't, angels. Don't blink and the don't weeping. smell. <laughs> These statues aren't moving, but my God, the smell. <laughs> Welcome to our new segment, which Doctor Who villain is farting today? The master. <laughs> the master of yeah, farter. I'd like him to do the... <laughs> Oh, Sorry. God. Laser farts. <laughs> Who'd use Sonic? He'd shrink them. <laughs> shrink you with the fart. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Just stand, all right. just stand still. Oh. oh, all those bad episodes are <laughs> done. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, it was just you and I, but look, you know, it's nice to see we haven't seen each other for a few weeks. No, it has been a while. A good, month. good to hear. A yeah. month. Our yeah, listeners don't know that. It's no, been a but month. It's, it's good to see that you're you're on the mend. I am. You know, we've, I uh, am. We've had a couple of monster flus go through uh, oh, Brisbane and then they've been brought us both down. Horrible, horrible flu season. Us guests, everyone. Like, yeah, good. Yeah. Hopefully that's done. We have made references to it before in previous episodes, but I feel like we need to make it official. All right. Nakia, what movie do you think would be improved by adding the Doctor? I absolutely believe Aladdin. Aladdin. This is the cartoon version? The cartoon or the live action. action, I think the genie should be... Because we haven't got Robin Williams anymore, yeah, so we can peace. get rid of the genie and have the Doctor as the genie role. <laughs> that would I be think great. That would be fantastic. <laughs> he grants wishes with his sonic screwdriver. Yeah, or takes you off in the TARDIS, yeah. or you know. And and as we were saying uh, before we started the podcast, Prince Ali, he fabulous, fabulous he Ali can't sing too Bob. much. Can't sing too much. We don't have the rights to it. Oh, we don't. <laughs> we don't. And Beck leaves every time we sing. It. Yes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Aladdin is one of my favourite. Favourite movies, favourite musicals, yeah. It's my favourite one that the kids ever had. 
That and Beauty and the Beast, I did quite love that. Right. Just pop the doctor in as the yeah, genie and, and let's see how that goes. Although, and, and is our resident artist going to do us up a movie poster? We'll see. I'm we'll looking see. at her. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was Adam's thing. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Like, we'll, we'll we'll try. We'll we'll figure out that out. But yeah, yeah. We'll, well, you're we'll the. I mean, I can, but Adam likes sending me all the new movie posters. That oh he well, makes then up. that's an oh, Adam well, we'll, thing. we'll talk about. We can alternate, maybe. Yeah, we'll oh, you just cut all that out when I asked. Really, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, but I will but say, Nakia, she knows nothing. <laughs> we do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know, but after the podcast, we do that. <laughs> It's weird that we have sex and then, then record. Yeah, I know. I think it's strange. Adult episodes. <laughs> I will say, uh, if you go on YouTube and look for uh, someone has cut together a duet between Robin Williams and Will Smith. Oh, really? Of Friend Like Me. And it's actually really good because they take the obviously the best moments of Robin Williams where he's doing all those funny voices yeah. and all that sort of stuff. They pair it with Will Smith doing his thing. Obviously, it's not as good as Robin Williams doing it by himself, yeah. but it's way better than Will Smith doing it by himself. Himself. Yeah, look, it's, it was always going to be a really hard role to step into. Robin Williams was is Robin Williams. I've started doing impressions and trying to make people laugh because of Robin Williams. Like I yeah. grew up watching Robin Williams. You know, I did. I didn't see him do stand up until I was in in high school. Yeah, because I didn't know he was. He was and Mendy when I first watched. Yeah, him. If, and then yeah. I, if you want to cry, go watch the Robin Williams um, documentary on Netflix. I've seen him live at the Met. Oh my God. I'm um, no, no, I wasn't there. I've seen oh. the. the <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, I can see that too, but yeah, yeah. No, I wish I had. I wish I had. He that would be was, amazing. He's one of those most amazing comedians. It's ever. a shame that, you know, near the end of his uh, career he was... Uh, not well. Not well, but also being given not great movies. Like yeah. that Adam Sandler sort of thing. Yeah, you know, like I know. Like the movies at the end of his career weren't great. But, I mean, you know, robots and stuff, he had... He had a few good stuff. And Goodwill Hunting. And oh, Goodwill Hunting is amazing. Dead Poet Society, oh, where I cried. Goodwill, Goodwill Hunting cried. is only a movie because of Robin Williams. Oh, it's so good. He said, no, you have to let these two kids act in this movie because they've written it, blah, 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 and, and that movie wouldn't wouldn't exist without Robin Williams. So That's quite sad, but that would be mine. That would yep, be my fantastic. movie. Let's dedicate this episode to Robin Williams. Yeah, yeah, let's. As always, you can follow Adam O'Sullivan Comedian on Facebook and visit thenerdinfinite.com. Adam is always busy. And I never do anything. <laughs> and I always consider myself really lazy compared to Adam <laughs> because Adam's doing everything. And I was saying, oh, you know, I did everything when I had kids. I'll have a rest now. Yeah, and I don't have kids, probably will never have kids. Oh, you don't know. I'm almost 40, so, you know. Oh, you're not almost 40, for God's sake. <laughs> Just a reminder, D4WH is on Facebook. So please give our page a like. Follow us on Twitter and on Instagram, D4WHpod. You can rate and review us on iTunes, recommend us on Facebook and follow us on Podbean. We're also now available on Spotify and Stitcher. Tell your friends about us. If you see someone on the street wearing a Doctor Who t-shirt, politely go up and tell them they should listen to our podcast. All right. Get the word out. So we have our suggestions here. Let's have a look. So our location is a clubhouse. Oh, it's just amazing how these fit together. A location is a clubhouse. The object is a lollipop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's how the doctor was grooming Rose. <laughs> Oh, God. I hope I can come up with something lollipop. better than that. Come into the club. <laughs> uh, you're 12 years old, hanging out with your friends. It's the 80s. Uh, everything's cool, guys. Do, 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 your pants are really high. Your pants are really high. Your Everyone's wearing suspenders big. and braces. <laughs> you jump up in your, your treehouse, which we don't really have here in Australia, but mm. let's pretend you've got a treehouse. You go inside and there's – wait, something's different about your treehouse. You go inside and it's all like – it's like a – it's like a – Huge sci-fi mechanical room and there's oh. a man there and he goes, hello, I'm the doctor. <gasps> Have a lollipop. <laughs> he gives you a lollipop uh, and then you fall asleep and then you wake up. <laughs> and you're 19. <laughs> and you're, yeah, you're 19 years old and you go travelling with the doctor and he says you've been a very good companion. And you're like, can I ever go home? And he says, no, no, you're my companion now. You live with me in the TARDIS. I created you. <laughs> and then it's this whole weird alternate reality where you have to try and get away from the doctor. <laughs> what is going on? This episode has been so weird. Listening to D4WH while trying to escape the doctor. And one day you manage to get away from the doctor. You find yourself back at home. You find yourself a little place. And then one day a little kid comes knocking on your door and you're like, would you like to come in for a lollipop? <laughs> 
And, and the cycle repeats. <laughs> and that's how I found Nakia. And that's why we do this podcast, D4WH. Until next time, keep searching the skies for the Doctor. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. This has been a production of The, the Nerd, Nerd Infinite. Infinite. And then the sound of dragons spitting fire and stuff. What? Why are you looking at me like that?